going to cover the basics of antiretroviral resistance. In this section, we will learn about the cause of resistance, relationships between adherence and resistance, and common mutations that we see at first and second line failure. In a person who is not taking antiretrovirals, the rate of turnover of HIV is enormous. The HIV can make 1 to 10 billion copies of itself a day. It's a very simple virus. It comes with a few enzymes, the reverse transcriptase, the protease, and the integrase enzyme, and a piece, a single piece of virus, viral RNA. The reverse transcriptase is responsible for copying that viral RNA to make new RNA for the new viruses. And that reverse transcriptase makes mistakes. So every time it goes down the 10,000 different um, sugars in that RNA, it replaces them with usually the correct one, but between one and three incorrect ones for each new virus that is made. That means that you're, you have a pool of virus in the body that is heterogeneous, it is different, it looks like a box of popcorn. Each one can be identified as a virus, but each one looks slightly different. Some of those viruses will have changes that make them resistant, that make that virus innately resistant to the drugs. It's like a small conformational change in the reverse transcriptase enzyme, in the new reverse transcriptase enzyme that doesn't allow a drug to bind. And if the, 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 those, so those drug resistant mutations exist prior to the introduction of drugs. And if we then give treatment at inadequate levels, we allow those mutations to be selected out and to become the primary population in that viral pool. So what causes resistance? Firstly, poor adherence. Allowing a drug level to befall below the level that actually inhibits the, the replication of the virus will mean that the virus will be growing in the presence of low levels of drug. And treatment interruptions are another way of, of having the same situation happen. Efavirenz has a very long half-life. Tenofovirin 3TC is a lot shorter, so in fact you end up with a long tail of your non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And viral replication then occurs in the presence of low drug levels. It basically then becomes a cycle. If you have less than perfect adherence, you get incomplete viral suppression, you get replication of virus in the presence of antiretroviral therapy, you get selection out of those resistant mutations, which then means the drugs no longer work and the whole process carries on. Just to show this in a schematic fashion, on the left hand side we have a whole lot of wild type virus which are the yellow dots and we have a single virus which just through the process of replication happens to have the M184V mutation that, incur, that uh, confers resistance to 3TC. If we then gave 3TC on its own, which we never do, but if we did, um, that, that 3TC would suppress the yellow viruses because it, it can get into that reverse transcriptase and inhibit that reverse transcriptase, but it cannot inhibit the red viruses because it's got a conformational change that's keeping it out. That means that some months to days down the line, you're going to have a pool of virus that is full of M184V and very few viruses that are actually sensitive to 3TC. Looking at the relationship between resistance and adherence, people who take 100% of their medication usually do very well. Their virus is suppressed, they don't have viral replication, and they, they don't develop resistance very rapidly. So if you look at the slide, it shows people with 100% adherence. It's they're going to develop resistance at a rate of 8% per annum. So it'll be 10 years before that population develops resistance. People who take no drug at all, don't have enough drug in their blood to allow a, a mutant mutation virus to grow up. There isn't enough drug there to allow that selection. It's the people that do relatively well, so the people who sit with adherence between 80 and 95 percent who develop resistance most rapidly. They have in, they're, they're allowing the virus enough times with low drug level to allow it to replicate, but they are actually taking enough to keep it suppressed for a large amount of the time. So they develop, it's probably between one and three years before somebody with adherence of 80 to 89 percent actually develops resistance. So it's your people that are doing relatively well. Those that are doing badly, they're going to continue to progress from an HIV perspective and develop AIDS, but they're not going to develop drug resistance. The people who are doing really well suppress, and it's the people in the middle who develop um, resistance. 
So to look at that schematically, if you have that same viral pool, but this time we have a virus, uh, the red one that's resistant to 3TC, it's got one mutation to 3TC, the blue one has a single resistance um, mutation to tenofovir, and the green one to efavirenz, if we actually give um, a triple therapy with all three of those drugs and the patient takes the medication perfectly, we get viral suppression and we have uh, that single virus there just indicates an undetectable level of a virus in the blood. If um, <clears throat> we have the same viral pool to start with, but people take the antiretrovirals that's with sub allowing subtherapeutic drug levels, so the adherence is between 70 to 90 percent, we get um, the, 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 the virus is allowed to replicate in the presence of drug. So those viruses that have single mutations definitely have a growth advantage, and they can also replicate and develop more mutations. And we get the pink viruses, which have mutations to both to both 3TC and efavirenz, and we develop multi-drug resistance by allowing that virus to replicate while we are taking medication. In people who don't take any medication at all, the viral pool on treatment and the viral pool pre-treatment look much the same. There is minimal suppression of the virus, but there's also minimal selection out of the resistant mutations. The common mutations we see at first and second line failure are um, for FTC, or 3TC is the M184V. That nomenclature basically means that the protein um, that is in the pos at position 184, which is the M, or methionine, is replaced with the V protein through the mistake made by the reverse transcriptase. So at position 184, we are replacing M with V, and that is the name of the mutation. That mutation takes out 3TC and FTC. Tenofovir, the common mutation for tenofovir is K65R, and the common mutation for efavirenz is K103N or Y181C. So when you see these mutations on a genotype, these are the drugs that they're likely to, to cause resistance to. In second-line failure, we see fairly infrequent protease inhibitors mutations, um, but for AZT, we get the thymidine analog mutations, or TAMs, which include K70R, D67N, and M41L. In summary, the absence of viral replication means that resistance cannot develop. If you're taking your medication every day, you suppress your virus nicely, you don't get resistance. But viral replication in the presence of low drug levels, either through non-adherence or through treatment interruption, does result in resistance. And poor, um, and that is going to impact on your future long-term success of either your first or second line treatment regimens. Thank you.